Have you ever been in a disagreement with someone you could tell was fighting a little bit dirty but you couldn't quite figure out how? Or maybe you've been accused of using a logical fallacy and you're thinking, what's a Logitech fantasy? This video is for you. Logical fallacies use faulty reasoning to make arguments that might seem well-reasoned if left unexamined. They're widely used and are basically the dark arts of reasoning, but you can neutralize them by exposing their wormy logic. We're gonna hit the top 10, starting with ad hominem. In its simplest form, this is just a personal attack. Unrelated to the argument. That last bit's important. Let's say politician Lot Dodd claims he will lower inflation during a debate. His opponent says, You know Lot Dodd has had three affairs while in office. This is irrelevant to whether Lot Dodd is able to lower inflation, so it's an example of ad hominem. However, there are valid versions of the argument if they're relevant. For example, if Lot Dodd was claiming to represent family values, his three affairs would be an appropriate rebuttal to his claims. The next fallacy is a type of ad hominem. To quote qui, to quote quae, who's to say? Is pretty much a way of attacking someone's behavior as inconsistent with their argument. For example, a parent tells their child they shouldn't smoke because it causes lung cancer. The child says, look who's talking, you smoked for years. A variation on this is often called whataboutism, which responds with a counter accusation rather than a defense of the original accusation. For example, someone accuses Lot Dodd of ordering the slaughter of a thousand Nebulians, to which he responds, what about Newt Gunray? He ordered the slaughter of 3,000 Gungans, and you're coming after me? The existence of one bad thing does not negate the existence of another. Next up, straw man. This is where someone misrepresents or exaggerates someone else's argument, then attacks the distorted version without acknowledging the difference between the actual argument and the argument they created. For example, a couple's deciding where to have dinner. One suggests pizza while his girlfriend says she would prefer Japanese. The boyfriend asks why his girlfriend hates the Italian people, of which he is one and proud. His girlfriend points out that she never said she hated the Italian people, and besides, if he's really gonna go down that route, she's twice the Italian he'll ever be. Anyway, this leads a couple into their next fallacy, the false dichotomy or false dilemma, which involves presenting a number of options as if they're the only choice when there are other viable alternatives. Our boyfriend is undeterred by his girlfriend's dedication to Mother Italia and is a little stupido, so he takes the argument further, suggesting that they either have pizza for dinner or his girlfriend must hate Italy, which is a false dilemma. The other option is that his girlfriend can prefer Japanese food and still love Mother Italia. Another fallacy using faulty reasoning is the non sequitur, which is Latin for does not follow. For example, let's say old mate Captain Cook is out for a walk in Van Diemen's Land and he comes across a strange creature. He proclaims, All birds have beaks and this jolly fellow has a beak. Therefore, this creature is a bird. He's wrong, of course, because it doesn't follow that just because all birds have beaks, any creature with a beak is a bird. The jolly little fellow is, of course, the marsupial known as the duck nose vole. Speaking of non sequiturs, a loaded question has a controversial assumption built in and attempts to limit direct replies like yes or no to those that serve the questioner's agenda. It also protects the questioner from accusations of false claims because the assumption is hidden inside the question. Very tricky. For example, let's say Nancy, Steve and Jonathan are sitting around having a chat, when suddenly Steve asks Jonathan whether he's still having problems with sudden onset explosive diarrhea. Whether Jonathan answers yes or no, the implication is that he does have problems with explosive diarrhea, which might fluster him and put him on the back foot. Steve has done this on purpose. What a jerk. Jonathan's diarrhea is presupposed by the question, and the phrasing narrows the respondent down to two misleading answers, yes or no. The genetic fallacy bases the validity of an argument on its origins, where or who it came from, rather than assessing the merit of the argument itself. This might not sound so bad at first, we all have biases, and I'm sure you can think of a talking head whose opinion you automatically dismiss. Huh? When used negatively, it's more like an insidious version of ad hominem because it leverages existing negative perceptions to make someone's argument look bad without actually presenting a case for why the argument itself lacks merit. For example, when Western countries considered implementing smoking bans, tobacco companies appealed to the origins of smoking bans to dissuade public support. Turns out, Germans had found a causal relationship between smoking and cancer early in the 20th century, which led to the most powerful anti-smoking movement in the world during the 1930s and early 1940s. Decades later, tobacco companies were quick to draw attention to the origins of smoking bans when countries considered them. Does the fact Nazis originated smoking bans have any bearing on the validity of smoking bans? Of course not. Good arguments are good arguments, 
regardless of their origin. A subtype of genetic fallacy is gonna be the first of our appeals to, the appeal to authority or argument from authority. While the genetic fallacy involves dismissing or accepting a claim based on its origin rather than its merit, the appeal to authority relies on the perceived credibility of the source, claiming something is true simply because someone in a position of authority or expertise says it is. For example, Lot Dodd tells Han that drinking bantha milk gives you wings. Han tells Lot Dodd he's full of poodoo, but Lot says he knows it's true because he heard it on beloved neuroscientist Poodoman's podcast. Citing a respected neuroscientist does not validate Lot Dodd's point. Lot must be able to substantiate the argument himself, rather than suggesting that because Poodoman is held in good regard, the claim stands on his reputation. Next, the appeal to emotion, or argumentum ad passiones. It occurs when someone manipulates someone else's emotions in order to win an argument, especially when there's no evidence. Eliciting emotion isn't always a bad thing. Midwest emo has a special place in my heart, but it is when the emotions that are elicited are irrelevant to establishing the truth and distract from the rational consideration of the relevant information. Imagine the following. You're about to sit down to enjoy a milkshake when your housemate appears from nowhere and says, can I have your milkshake? You know how much I love them. I've had such a hard day. This milkshake would make me feel so much better. You don't want me to be down in the dumps, do you? Who's this guy? He thinks he can come in and drink your milkshake. It doesn't make any sense. He's appealing to your emotion based on his lack of a compelling argument based in reason. Bad dude. Don't give him a bowling pin. And finally, we have the appeal to popularity, also known as ad populum or the bandwagon fallacy. It assumes that because an idea is held by a majority, it must be correct, when in reality, the popularity of an idea has nothing to do with its truth. For example, the day after one housemate drank your milkshake, the other housemate comes in and says, You know, Daniel has been missing since yesterday evening, even though he was supposed to be here for his birthday party last night. To which you say, we better report him missing. You can't submit a missing person's report unless they have been missing for 24 hours, says your housemate. No, that's not true, you say. Your housemate says, Yes, it is. Everyone knows that. To suggest otherwise is ridiculous. Despite what your housemate says, you don't have to wait 24 hours or any amount of time to declare someone missing. People got that idea from TV. There are plenty more, but I'd say those are the most frequently used in my experience. So next time someone tries to tell you a porcupine, you can see how it's made. More videos to come soon. Thanks for watching.